Whatever happened to Crooks and Castles clothing? During the early to mid-2000s, Crooks and Castles was one of the leading brands in a booming streetwear market. Their pieces sold for a premium and could be spotted everywhere from rappers to mall crawlers and all in between. But like many of the top brands from that era, Crooks and Castles was not able to make it into the 2020s with that same footing. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com. And in today's video, we'll discuss the rise and fall of Crooks and Castles clothing. But before we get started, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps us grow, helps us spread the word, and helps us get the reach out there. So without further ado, let's jump right in. The brand was founded in 2002 by Dennis Calvero and partner Rob Panlilio and based in Cerritos, California. The two friends came together with a dream in mind of an aesthetic merger of hip hop lifestyle and luxury sensibility. And what they created would in many ways be the grandfather of some of the luxury brand by streetwear brand mashup stuff that will later come around. But before Crooks and Castles was even a thing, the two friends would first try their hand with a brand known as L5 Landscape, a streetwear line with an outdoor vibe. The brand thrived in Japanese markets in the late 90s, selling exclusively at United Arrows and creating buzz on a national level. The US wasn't quite ready for it though, and a sell through rate on their home turf suffered. On this side of the world, the public wasn't quite primed yet for the whole streetwear startup craze that would come later on. The two friends would head back to the drawing board. They still had a passion to get their vision out to the world and were determined to bounce back stronger than ever. Over the years, they'd continue to work on their vision. But by 2002 came a palatable shift in urban style, leaning in the direction of indie streetwear. This was a clear signal that it was time to go full force with their new venture. For Calvero and Panlilio, having grown up in Los Angeles during the heavy gang culture in the 80s and 90s, they decided to draw on their upbringing for the name and the theme of their next brand. The inspiration for the gear was life on the streets in Los Angeles, but also the drive and fire of the world's most successful modern day entrepreneurs who were willing to do whatever it took to achieve success. Energized by their common upbringing and cultural encounters, Calvero and Panlilio decided to call their new brand Crooks and Castles. The name was inspired by their younger realities and the premise that everyone in their world had to hustle to make it to the top. Founded on the notions of family and loyalty, the label aligned itself with every hustler, entrepreneur, and mogul trying to win. It was about the journey from being a crook to becoming a king. The brand's aesthetic was characterized by bold slogan t-shirts, prints, heavy branding, and experimental uses of colors. This showed an element of recognition to what is now considered the retro West Coast style. The brand would go on to thrive through the wave of indie streetwear, but they would also experience some criticism by some. They would get heat for their whole cocaine and caviar campaign, which some thought glamorized drug use. But this wouldn't hurt the brand's upper mobility though. They would continue to experience success and in 2007, they would open their first flagship store in the famed Melrose District in Los Angeles. Some would also give them flack about their appropriation of the famous Versace Medusa Head logo. After all, the Medusa Head is probably one of the most recognizable logos in fashion. So when Crooks and Castles came on the scene in 2002, they knew that giving the Fashion House logo a street makeover would likely change the game. And they were right. It did. Parody tees weren't that prevalent back in the early 2000s, but after this, many other brands began doing similar designs. Crooks and Castles leaned heavy on the LA street culture for their design inspiration, using lots of old English lettering and looks to harken back to the old school hardcore gang culture days of the City of Angels. They also used lots of luxury aesthetic, such as various other Versace and Gucci style looks, animal prints, and gold chain designs. Crooks and Castles would boom during the t-shirt and snapback era, serving at the time as one of the most respected brands in the industry. However, they would eventually fall victim to the same thing that befell many startup brands of the day. How many graphic tees can you have in your closet before you decide to change up the look a little bit? This is a question many consumers began to subconsciously ask themselves. So sometime after 2010 or so, streetwear brands began to try their hands at cutting sew pieces to add more respectable feel to their companies. Crooks and Castle will be no different. 
They will begin to release more cut and sew pieces along with their t-shirt and hat designs and were able to come out with some pretty nice looking ones. Eventually in 2016, they will partner with 12 Ounce, a Montreal headquartered manufacturing and international clothing distribution company. The following year, they would make news, but not in a good way, by closing their Fairfax flagship location. But the founders would insist that it was with the aim of building a robust e-commerce site and turning attention to its wholesale strategy. But only a year later, in 2017, Calvero announced that Crooks and Castles had dissolved its partnership with 12 Ounce, intending to re-enter the wholesale market with an unannounced manufacturing partner. A 12 Ounce spokesperson said that the Canadian company still owned the license for exclusive distribution through the end of 2018. But Calvero contested that statement and said that the Crooks legal representation had informed the Montreal company that the partnership had been terminated. Believing that Crooks and Castles were one of the originators of the contemporary Lux Street image, Calvero worked alongside his partner Panlilio and an additional financial partner to buy the company back. Looking to work on a smaller scale distribution in the North American market and attempting to figure out what sold best, what the modern consumer wanted, and where growth could be expected. Calvero believed around this time that the key to Crooks and Castles making a comeback heavily hinged on linking up with celebrities and influencers. Which I could understand where they were coming from with this thinking considering that around this time collabs were really beginning to gain momentum. So Crooks and Castles was set out to find the right someone to work with. They would eventually reopen a new location in Los Angeles and in 2020 announced a collab with LA famed record label Death Row Records. Death Row Records had recently been bought by E1, which we did a video on that you should check out later. But I'm sure E1 was eager to do business with anyone just about to get that money back that they had basically just spent on acquiring the rights to Death Row brand. The capsule consisted mainly of mashups between the classic Death Row logo and the bandana wearing Medusa that Crooks and Castles became synonymous with. It didn't do what I'm sure both entities would have liked, and to be honest, I didn't even really know it had dropped until I did research for this video, so I guess. Crooks and Castles legitimately played a big role in the whole luxury brand streetwear obsession. They were one of the progenitors of the streetwear with upscale looks. Albeit by sometimes jacking some of the designs of some of the more famed European fashion houses. But in the end, they will fall victim to the same thing that spelled the downfall of many brands from that era. For some reason, consumers had very little patience with startup streetwear brands. They treated them like a passing fad, here today and gone tomorrow, while legacy European brands get perpetual passes. The high fashion houses have been around forever constantly reinventing themselves with each generation and people love them for it but when it came to startup brands from the streetwear peak for some reason they didn't get that same respect they were discarded and tossed aside the second many deemed them played out or no longer relevant while in a very ironic move some high fashion brands would make a turn and begin making tons of money by appropriating looks popularized by many streetwear brands that had ripped them off in the past Calvero will be quoted in saying this. I think fashion has its cycles and its cycles are created to wash out what isn't meant to be around any longer. For a 16 year old brand to have gone through a couple of cycles, I believe it proves that we aren't going anywhere and our brand is still whole relevance. We help create the streetwear niche in fashion. We're part of the reason why it's even a category, end quote. And I think he's right. They did help bring a luxury look to streetwear and for that, they'll be remembered. As for a comeback though, well that remains to be seen. I think it's possible. They're still actively looking for celebs to partner with and if they link up with the right person, they could drive hype back into the brand. But what do you think? Would you still wear Crooks and Castles today? Let us know in the comment section. Also, if you made it all the way through the entire video, then we sincerely thank you and ask that you please leave a like to show your admiration. Also, if you want to be updated whenever we drop new videos such as this, which we will be doing a rise and fall of streetwear brands series once per week, then hit the subscribe button. So if you hit the notification bell, you'll be updated every time we drop another video. So with that being said, I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com signing out. Until next time, peace.